today's topic is about a case study of deep generative models um, in, in the text domain about like text generation. Uh, so this is a little bit a little bit different from the uh, from what are uh, on the syllabus because um, the unified view of deep generative models um, actually has been covered in the in this lecture, the first part of deep generative models. So um, today we'll be like discussing a case study on um, text generation. So um, first of all, right, what, what is text generation? So text generation is a for a broad concept, a broad set of um, tasks in natural language processing. So the goal is to generate a natural language from the input data or like um, machine representations. And it spans a broad set of NLP tasks. I'll give, uh, like I say, we know like a chatbot or like a dialogue system. Right? Um, the input is like a, the chatbot, uh, the, the dialogue history, and the output is a response. Right? We want kind of like generate and uh, kind of show to the, uh, to the human. And the machine translation right, input is in, say, an English sentence, and the output is a Chinese sentence. And there are other tasks, like a, um, text summarization, right, giving a, a document. We want to generate a short paragraph that summarizes the content in the document. And uh, like um, image captioning, right, the input is an image or a video, and the output is a short, short description of the activities in the image. Or like like speech arm recognition, right, which transforms the speech signals to like a transcripts. So um, there are a lot of like different tasks in this uh, text generation problems. And underlying this uh, broad set of tasks, there are basically two central goals in um, for this problem. The first is um, generating human-like grammatical and uh, readable text, or like basically we want to generate so-called natural language, right? The language must be natural and uh, fluent and uh, um, just like how human would write the text. And the second goal is that we want to generate a text that contains the desired information from, uh, in, inferred from the input. Say um, in machine translation, right? The, generated sentence must be uh, with the same meaning with the input sentence, right? So that's uh, the, the target sentence is the translation of the, uh, of the input sentence. And the data description, right, the reports we generated must be like describing the input table, say, right? And, and uh, uh, for other tasks, like we want to control the attributes of the sentence, given a sentiment label like positive, we want to generate a sentence that is of positive sentiment. Like I like this restaurant. So um, this output must be um, containing the desired information that's specified in the input. And the same like for conversational flow, like we we want to like control the conversation strategy and the topic, right? Given the um, as specified in the input. So there are basically two central goals. Uh, let, let's first uh, take a look at how we can achieve the first goal, as right? generating natural language. Uh, the common model for the text generation, the most basic model, basically, um, the, is the language model. So in language model, um, given a sentence, right, um, y, which, is, uh, which consists of a sequence of tokens, a language model basically can uh, calculate the probability of a sentence or a piece of text by decomposing the probability of this whole sentence across the time steps or across the our tokens. And each token the, has a kind of like conditional distribution, right? Um, this distribution is like conditioning on the, all previous tokens. So this is a kind of like a, a model of this uh, text. And if we want to implement this, sometime uh, usually we can use like say a recurrent network, right? As we have seen last in the last lecture, like say we use a LSTN, and the model is kind of a sequence of tokens. Right? 
Yeah, this is the language model. And the two like, are kind of like incorporates the input data, right? Uh, say in machine translation, this X is a, a source sentence, the input sentence. Um, this, this whole language model will be additionally conditioning on this uh, additional context. So we will have a conditional language model here. And the context is like, um, yeah, so yeah, the context will be like uh, input into this uh, language model and uh, all the inference like um, in the decoding process will be conditioning on this context. Okay, so how do we train this uh, model, right? Um, the training algorithm, there are a lot of like training algorithms we can, uh, we can use. There's kind of like the most kind of um, popular or like simplest methods is the uh, maximum likelihood estimation is pretty uh, straightforward. So um, to train a model, right, we are given a set of data examples and we just maximize the data log likelihood. Right, given the ground truth data, white star, right, um, we just like evaluate the, maximize the log likelihood of the data, right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this is the training. And then for evaluation, um, the evaluation is a little bit different. Like we have different uh, metrics specific to each of the tasks. Like say in machine translation, we have the metric called like blue, right? So we can compute the blue score between the generation by the model and the ground truth data. So uh, this blue score basically evaluates the similarity of the output and the ground truth. And for summarization, we have a, a, another different like metric, and the, there are other like metrics for different tasks. So you can see um, there, there's um, basically two issues of uh, maximum likelihood estimation for text generation. The first issue is um, so-called exposure bias. Um, so we can see like um, at the training time. Right, um, we maximize the data log likelihood. So, and uh, for each token, right, we predict the next token given the previous ground truth tokens. So this is the, in the training phase. Right, um, we, we, we are given this ground truth token, tokens and we input this tokens like Y1 star, right? And we predict the next token, uh, Y2 hat. But in, at the evaluation, we don't have these ground truth tokens, right? So at the, at the evaluation time, we predict next token given the previous sequence that are generated by the model itself. Right? So you can see there is a dis discrepancy between training and the evaluation. At the training time, the model will see the ground truth um, for the previous tokens, but at the evaluation time, we can only use the sequence generated by the model. So uh, that means like uh, in another way, right, at the training time, the model is not exposed to the sequences it, uh, it will produce. And sometimes this uh, previous sequence, right, produced by, by the model will contain some uh, mistakes or like errors, right? So like I say, if this Y1 head is, is, is a mistake, right, is a kind of a wrong token, this, this particular token will affect the, uh, subsequent inferences and uh, basically this uh, follow-up tokens will also be like a mistake. So um, this is what we call the exposure bias. Um, and the second issue is that we can see like at the training time, we, the metric is the data log likelihood, right? We, ma we maximize the uh, likelihood, but at the evaluation time, we use a different metric to e um, to measure the performance of the model, like a blue score at, um, for machine translation. So you can see there's a, another discrepancy between training and the evaluation, right? So we, have, we, we kind of like use different metrics uh, for training and the evaluation. Yeah, so um, there are a lot of like follow up uh, training algorithms that, that are trying to like fix these two uh, fundamental issues. Say a, pos a possible solution is the reinforcement learning, which I think um, the, uh, the follow-up uh, lectures will cover some of the aspects of reinforcement learning. So here, um, basically, 
reverse learning is to like maximize the expected rewards under the model distribution. So here, our this is say this is your language model, right? So you want to learn this model, and you have some like a reward function or like a evaluation matrix. And the objective is like this: we want to maximize the ex expected reward under this uh, under your model, basically. So um. Yeah, so basically, like I say, you, you can plug in, plug like whatever evaluation metric you want to use. Right? Like in machine translation, we, here we can use the blue score as the reward. And uh, so uh, this basically fix the issue of like uh, the discrepancy between like a uh, training metric and the evaluation metric, right? Because like here at training time, we are maximizing the blue score. But of course, like uh, reverse learning is not the, the, the perfect solution. It, it has uh, its own um, issues. Like um, you can see, like generally, basically here we will ask first use the model to generate the whole sentence, right? And you evaluate the quality of the sentence using the evaluation metric. But we can see, like this, there is here is a kind of ex extremely large sequence space, like right? if say if the our vocabulary size is like uh, 50,000, and we want to generate a sentence of containing like uh, 50 tokens, then this space will be very, very large. And uh, that means like uh, the, the search space right, um, will be too large, and uh, the training will be very inefficient. Because like most of the time, this model will generate something that is not simply not meaningful, and this, uh, this blue score will be very, Kind of very low, and you cannot really like train this model in an effective way. And also the same reason, right? Um, there will be a high variance and the poor exper uh, exploration efficiency during training because of this uh, very large sequence space. So there are a lot of works like uh, kind of like a trying to fix this uh, uh, kind of like training training issues to make this training more practical. One of the uh, algorithms is like a reward augmented maximum likelihood. So basically, the, the high level idea is like we can add a reward aware um, perturbation to the MLE data examples. Like we given a given a training, a set of training data in MLE, we can like uh, add some noise to the training data. So that the, at the training time, the model will also see some of the kind of like mistakes. Um, in the training data instead of the kind of like perfect uh, perfect data. And the list noise will be like uh, informed by the particular reward. This reward is like say in machine translation again, this reward is the blue score, right? So we can like somehow like um, close the gap between the um, evaluation metrics between like uh, at training time and the evaluation time. And uh, uh, another algorithm is like a Soft, ma uh, soft, yeah, soft max policy gradients. Um, it's kind of like a, a extension of this um, standard policy gradients by using the reward distribution for effective sampling and uh, estimating the policy gradients. Uh, I won't go into more details of these algorithms, but um, here we uh, just need to know like there are different algorithms here to like uh, fix the issues in maximum likelihood estimation and and reinforcement learning. And the, and the, um, the other algorithm, like data noising, again, similar to this Ramo algorithm, is to like add a random noise to the data so that the model will be exposed to like uh, noises and mistakes at the training time. Okay, so there are different algorithms. And uh, actually, we can show that these algorithms are kind of like are closely connected with each other. Basically, we can show that um, there is a unifying formulation of these diverse linear algorithms. In particular, um, we, we have seen this right, uh, MLE, like uh, uh, softmax policy gradient, RAMO, and the data noising. And we can show that there are kind of like a, like, like basically, uh, there is a kind of unifying formulation, and uh, this formulation is governed by three hyperparameters. Say, so R is the reward function. And alpha and beta are two like uh, balancing weights, two like scalars. And uh, by 
setting these different these hyperparameters to different values, we can recover these different algorithms. Essentially, um, like I say, um, uh, Remo and MLE, right? The only difference is that they are using different reward functions. Uh, we'll see more details later. And uh, yeah, all these algorithms are special instances of a generalized entropy regularized um, policy of optimization framework. And the only difference is the choice of the reward R and the values of some hyperparameters R and base. Basically, this unified view inspires new and improved algorithms. Let's see uh, more details here. So this is the uh, generalized uh, so-called like, ERPO framework. So we consider a sequence generation model, right? P theta y given x this is a conditional language model. And given a whatever reward function, right? Um, y is the generation by the model, and the y star is the ground truth, like the blue score, right? In machine translation. And we assume a variational distribution, Q um, y given x, which is the approximation to this, uh, to to to, your, to the model of interest. And the objective of this framework is written uh, in this way. So basically, we are maximizing the our rewards right under under the version of distribution, right? So. And uh, there's a clear divergence between the version of distribution and the, um, and the model of interest. And then there's an additional like, entropy regularizer on the, um, on the version of distribution. So we can see this objective is pretty close to what you have seen in, ver uh, in versional inference or versional EM. Right? Um, it's essentially these two terms, right? the expectation and then the clear divergence. If we see like a P is the prior distribution and the Q is the uh, kind of like a, the, the version of distribution. Yeah, and uh, the only thing is like here we have an additional entropy regularizer and uh, there are two like um, hyperparameters of the bits to like uh, uh, kind of control the moderation of the two like uh, entropies. Yeah, so this is on. Um, if you know this, like a reinforced learning, you will see like this objective is a generalization of like many popular IR algorithms, like a relative entropy policy gradient, policy search, and like a trust region policy optimization. Yeah, I won't go in, uh, into these details, but yeah, this is the generalized objective. And let's see like how this objective can really like recover the specialized algorithms we have seen, like MLE and uh, Remo. Yeah, so um, yeah, first of all, I like um, a little bit more about this uh, framework. Uh, given this objective, right, we solve this uh, objective with a kind of like an EM step procedure. Like at a step, at iteration, uh, at each iteration, right, each step is like this. We first, we solve this, uh, uh, this, this problem, right, with regard to the version of distribution. And uh, there is a closed form solution for this um, version of this distribution, which you can see is a combination of the, uh, the model right, and the, the reward function. And alpha beta basically are kind of like balancing the, the weight of the two components. Yeah, and the M step, given this Q distribution, um, we maximize the Kind of like the log likelihood of the model, right? Um, with regard to the uh, the samples like generated from the, the Q distribution, so you can see this is a very close to the version of EM, right? Um, the East step has basically produced the uh, closed form solution for the version distribution, and then M step is like a, um, optimizing with regard to the um, model parameters. Okay, so uh, so here here is some like a intuitive interpretation of this uh, objective and the optimization. Like say uh, the rule of alpha, right? Let's see like if alpha um, tends to infinite, then we can see that right, uh, from this this part we'll see Q will equal will um, equal to this model, right? So from this um, solution. 
And also, this, this can also be seen here, right? So if alpha equals infinite, then um, like to, to minimize this scale divergence, right, Q will uh, equal to um, the model. And for beta, right, so if beta tends to infinite, then we can see this Q basically is a uniform distribution, right? Because like here, beta is very, um, if beta is very large, this corresponds to this term, right? If beta um, is very large, then we will maximize this entropy. That means Q must be a uniform distribution. And the, here, M step is basically maximizing the log likelihood of samples from uh, from the Q distribution. Yeah, so with this uh, objective and the optimization procedure, let's see, um, uh, MLE is actually a special case of this framework. So in MLE, we are basically using this type of uh, reward function. Here, R is set to this particular delta function. If the data, if the, if the sample y equals the, um, equal to this um, ground truth data, then the reward is one. Otherwise, um, the reward is negative infinite. And the alpha and beta are, are set to these particular values. Alpha is kind of like very, a very small positive value, like very close to zero. zero. And the beta is set to one. And we can see, like, basically, if we plug this uh, configuration into this E step, right, we can show that basically the Q distribution will be like this. Um, if X, if Y equals, y equals the ground truth, then you get one, and otherwise it is zero. So this is, in, this is essentially empirical data distribution, right? And then, like, uh, as we said, the M step is basically maximizing the log likelihood of samples from the Q distribution. And now we show like Q is the data distribution. That means the M step is basically maximizing the data log likelihood. So we recover this uh, MLE algorithm right, by setting uh, R and alpha beta to these particular values. Yeah, so um, this is MLE. And uh, yeah, so if we kind of like uh, visualize this um, the training procedure, we can see basically um, assume this is the whole exploration space, right? The, the whole space of the sequence. And uh, um, we, we are given a set of data examples, right? In this whole sequence, uh, in, in this whole space. And the MLE is, uh, can be seen as a policy optimization, right? With the delta function as reward, uh, delta function as the reward. So that means like uh, the exploration can only is the exploration of the model at the training time is restricted on this uh, set of points in the whole space, and any exploration beyond the training data, beyond the particular, uh, beyond the set of points, will kind of like uh, get negative infinite rewards. So this exploration um, will be get kind of like a uh, made a void, right? and uh, this this. Basically, explain the exposure bias, right? The model at the training time is only exposed to this uh, a small set of samples here, and uh, the whole the model is not exposed to the whole sequence space at the training time. But uh, the good thing is that given this delta function, because Q will re basically reduce the reduce to the empirical data distribution, so sampling from Q is pretty straightforward. That makes the computation of this model very. Um, very efficient. And also all these data samples are of high quality, right? Because these are ground truth data. Um, you will always get very high quality samples from, from the Q distribution. So this training of the model will be very efficient. Yeah, so this is the MLE, like an intuitive explanation of the advantage and disadvantage of the particular algorithm um, from the perspective of the more general um, framework. So, and the other algorithm, the REMO, like reward augmented on maximum likelihood, likelihood estimation, the only difference um, between MLE and the REMO is that now we replace this delta reward function with a kind of like a common reward, such as the blue score. Right, so 
the effective the, the effect is like this. Um, now with this particular rewards, the each step, right, we get this Q distribution uh, is kind of an exponentiated reward distribution. And the, at the M step, we are like maximizing the uh, reward augmented maximum like, uh, likelihood of log likelihood. So you can see um, the difference here, right? Um, we are not, no longer using the delta function as a reward, but instead using a, a, like a task specific reward right, at, at the each step. So this basically fix the issue in MLE, like the dis discrepancy between like training time and the evaluation time in terms of the evaluation metrics. And uh, um, yeah, basically this reward has this, this shape. Like I say, we have given the ground truth data, right? Um, this reward will give, will give a kind of a score, like kind of like um, in this shape, like um, we'll get the kind of highest score if y equals y star. But even if Y does not like really um, fully match the um, ground truth, you will still get some like a kind of like a score, right? Instead of like in in as a, in, in MLE, right? Where if we are using a delta reward, then only this point will get a score one, and all other points will get a negative infinity reward. Yeah. So if we visualize this um, optimization. Compared to MLE, right? Now, Remo uses a task dependent reward. And uh, this basically, this reward is more smooth than the uh, delta function. And this effectively um, permits a larger exploration space surrounding the training data, right? Because uh, here, right, we, can, we have scores like surrounding this uh, ground truth data. So in the sequence space, we basically allow the model to like, explore the whole space like a, um, kind of like a uh, close to the training data points. And uh, here, like because alpha equals tens, alpha is very small, let's basically ignore the model distribution for exploration because like um, here, uh, this, this, this term is uh, ignored because alpha is very small. So all the, sampling, all the samples from Q will be determined by the reward function. Yeah, this is the, um, the Remo on um, as a special case of the general framework. So the, uh, the next algorithm, the softmax policy gradient. Again, um, compared to Remo, you can see the only difference here is like uh, in Remo we have alpha and beta, like this, and the softmax policy gradients we kind of like change the alpha beta values to like alpha equals one and beta equals zero. So what does this mean? Like on um, at each step, now we have this solution for Q distribution. Um, like a, it's, a, it's a kind of like a, a multiplication of the mo model and the, the reward. And again, at M, uh, for M step, it's still like a maximizing the likelihoods of the samples from, from the Q distribution. And uh, here, if we visualize this, we can see like a soft max policy gradient use both the model distribution and the reward for exploration. So this basically permits the largest exploration space, right? You basically, the model can generate whatever sequence, whatever sequence, right? From in, in the whole like sequence space. Right. Um, yeah, so, uh, but the, the difficulty here is that, uh, as we said, like in, so, uh, in reinforcement learning, right, at, especially at the early stage of the training, this model is still like a, not well trained, right, and so that it can easily create samples that are of a low quality. So that means like a, in uh, sometimes this, the samples from this Q distribution will be. Uh, of low quality and the training of the model will be not that efficient. So this is the kind of, you can see a clear trade off here, right? Um, let, let, let me see, like, um, yeah, so like from MLE to Remo to soft max policy gradients, we are kind of incre in, uh, increasingly uh, expanding the exploration space, right, uh, at training time. But you can see like, um, 
another way of seeing this expansion is that we are kind of like allowing more and more noise at the training time, right? From the from the samples, uh, in, among the samples from the Q distribution. So given these noisy samples, uh, this, this optimization for the model distribution is kind of like a, getting like harder and harder. And uh, um, at, um, for this case, if you even need more like training tricks to allow the, uh, practical training. Yeah, and the, the last algorithm, data noising, right? um, again, is a special case. And uh, here, the same is that um, we, we still have this R and the beta values, but we are using a locally, just using a locally relaxed variant of the delta, uh, delta rewards in MLE. Here, uh, we don't really want um, like restrict that uh, the, the sample must be a kind of like exactly matching the, the ground truth. But instead, we can allow some like a discrepancy between the sample and the, the, the ground truth. Like say, um, we can allow a, a difference on a particular token, a single token, right, between the two sequences. So this basically like a, um, allow uh, this, this noise is kind of like we randomly select the token in the sequence, in the ground truth sequence, and uh, like uh, replace that token with another uniformly picked to token. So this is one kind of noise we can add to the training data, which is like a, uh, kind of like a, um, described it in this reward function. And uh, there are many ways of injecting the data, in, injecting noise to the, in, in the training data. So you can like uh, just uh, use different uh, type of conditions here, so to like recover different the um, data noising strategies. Yeah, and this is pretty close to the REMO, right? Um, because we can we add noise to the training data, which essentially uh, allow the model to like explore beyond the, the set of samples, kind of like a, the space is the space like surrounding the training data. And the difference between data noising and the REMO is that REMO will add reward-aware noise, right? Because here in REMO we are using a like a blue score as the um, as a reward, which um, in effect is like injecting the noise informed by the reward function, and the data noising is like adding the noise, kind of like in a more random way, right? We kind of like randomly sw uh, swap a token in, in the ground truth uh, sequence. So this um, the growth, the advantage here, like data noising, is easy to implement because like this um, swapping a token is pretty straightforward. But the demo, like if we want to incorporate the task specific rewards to inject the noise, is usually in practice is, is much harder to implement. Okay, so uh, for a quick summary, like um, for this set of different algorithms for sequence generation, uh, for training the sequence model, right? We get, we see like every algorithm corresponds to a point in the in the hyperparameter space. And from left to right, we are in increasingly like uh, uh, gradually like increasing the uh, exploration space at the training time. And uh, in theory, because like at the training time, the model kind of like uh, is exposed to the larger space, right? The larger key sequence space. So in theory, this, the model should be like perform, performing better and better, right? But the, the practical issue here is like the training will be will also be like a more and more difficult. So you can see basically there's, there's a trade-off. Right? And uh, our, a natural idea here is that um, we can like uh, interpolate among the algorithms, right? Because um, the, the, at the left the most points, right, the MLE is very easy to train, right? Um, but the exploration space is very small and uh, on the right, this is very hard, very difficult for training, but the exploration is like, a, uh, but we allow a larger like exploration space. So a natural idea is like, can we like interpolate between from left to right, right? Um, we kind of like train this, train the model um, at, on, at the early stage, we train the model with MLE. And uh, kind of like a great, then um, at the later space, uh, at the later stage, we replace this delta reward function with the, um, the task specific rewards, right, to allow like a larger, uh, 
exploration space. And then we also like a new alpha and bait from like this configuration to this configuration. So on in fact, we allow the model to gradually increase the exploration space at the training time and increasingly uh, increase, kind of like a, uh, increase the difficulty of the training. Right, so like a, this is kind of like a, by annealing these hyperparameters, we can like a, uh, interpolate between these algorithms. Yeah, so with this interpolation, with this uh, high level idea, here are some like um, results. Um, so in machine translation, right, with this um, annealing or like interpolation, we get like a better like a blue score at, uh, for machine translation. And also like for text summarization, um, we see like uh, improvements. And uh, this is the, basically the, the, the training curve, like um, kind of like a, uh, as we train this model, right, so the blue score kind of gradually like increase. And the, if we compare with the MLE and the REMO, basically um, this, we kind of like, um, like a, as we like train this model, like with like increasingly larger exploration space, um, the model will get like better performance. Yeah, but um, this is kind of like a pretty um, a quick introduction of this uh, interpolation algorithm. Okay, so this is the first part, um, how we can like generate a natural language. Like um, we basically visit two like common fundamental issues um, for sequence generation. The first is the exposure bias, and the second is the criteria mismatch. And uh, there are uh, many algorithms are uh, proposed to like fix these two issues, like MLE, Remo, soft max policy gradient, data noising, and the uh, standard policy gradient. And uh, all these algorithms can be like uh, subsumed in a unified framework for the sequence generation, like um, which um, in this under this framework, these algorithms corresponds to like um particular configurations of a couple of hyperparameters, like the reward function and the other and the base, the two uh, balancing weights. Yeah, so um, yeah, this is the first part. Um, yeah, the second part is like how we can like ensure like our model will generate the text that contains the desired information inferred from the input. So we see that um, for this different task, like machine translation, data description, and other uh, tasks, um, we, have, we basically have different amount of training, uh, training data, superficial data. Like as we know, like in machine translation, we have kind of like a very large amount of data, like tens of millions of training examples. So you can like directly use the supervised learning to train the model. And the data description, um, again, we, we, we have a certain amount of data, like uh, tens of thousands of uh, data examples. Um, it's kind of like, um, it's, it's still feasible to like, um, directly use like, supervised learning to train your model. And the same like, for senti uh, sentiment control. But for other settings, like um, say we want to modify a sentence like from sentiment positive to negative, we're still like, a, like a preserving other aspects, like the content of the sentence. Basically, we, we don't have any like superficial data. And the, for a more complex settings, like a, if we want to learn to control the conversation strategy and the topic, again, we don't have any uh, superficial data. So in these particular cases, we need some methods to like learn this controlled generation or conditional generation in an unsupervised setting. Yeah, so this part will particularly focus on this unsupervised setting. Yeah, so uh, here are some like uh, particular examples um, in in this setting, like um, text attribute transfer or like text content manipulation, and uh, for conversation we have like a target guided open domain conversation. Yeah, let, let's take a look at these um, different settings. First, um, text attribute transfer. So the task is like this. Um, given a sentence, we want to modify this sentence to have a desired um, attribute value while keeping all other aspects unchanged. 
say we want to, we want to say uh, we want to transfer like attributes like sentiment, tense, voice, and gender, and other different attributes of text. Like say um, to transfer sentiment right from negative to positive. But this is the input sentence. Like it was super dry and had a weird taste. We want to modify this sentence to a kind of like a, to have a positive sentiment. Right? It was super fresh and uh, a delicious kind of like taste. And the goal here is like we we want to like change the sentiment, but still like keep all other aspects unchanged, like um the, the, the content, right, the entire slides and the taste and the, like the super all these all these different aspects are keep unchanged. So the application of this time this kind of task can be like a personalized ethical writing, right? And like a personalized conversation systems. And the other different applications. Right, so uh, for a formal um, formulation, like giving an input sentence x and the original attributes ax, um, for which we want to control. And uh, uh, the task is basically that um, we were given this x and the, the target attributes ay. We want to generate a target sentence y. Y has the desired attributes. And Y keeps all attributes independent the properties of X. Um, so the training settings like this, um, we only have pairs like X and AX, but we don't have this direct supervision data like AX, A, AX and Y, AY. We don't have this parallel data. Um, yeah, so the next is like how we can use this Data right available to train this um, particular conditional generation model. Uh, so here's a, here's a possible solution. All right, um, we have this model right given given this x and uh, a y as a kind of um, x and a y are two inputs, and the goal is to generate the y. And uh, basically, we have this. Uh, this encoder, right? We first like encode the input sentence as a as a hidden hidden vector z, right? As a feature vector, and we concatenate this feature vector with the uh, the, the attribute value, like a, like for positive uh, sentiments, this is this a y equals one, right? For negative sentiments, this equals zero. And the conditioning on these two like uh, the concatenation of the two uh, features, we use a decoder to generate the y, right? Um, condition on these two. Yeah, and the key intuition for uh, training this model, we decompose the task into competitive sub sub uh, objects, and use direct supervision for each of the sub objects. Like say the first objective, right? Um, we want y, we want y to keep all attributes independent of the properties of x. So that means like y must be like a very close to the input of x, right? You you can only change some of the tokens in the whole sequence. So a very straightforward and very simple um, objective uh, way to like enforce the similarity between x and y is that we just use all the encoding laws, right? Um, we want basically we want y to be exactly to be exactly the same with x. So this is a very simplified and uh, Straightforward uh, way to like encourage this uh, like uh, the property uh, preservation basically. And the second objective, like we want y has the we want y to have the desired attribute y is a y, right? Say we want if this a y is like a positive sentiment, then we want y to have to really have the sentiment the post, uh, positive sentiment. So how can we encourage this? We use a classification loss, um, given a y um, sample right, from, from the model. We feed this sample to a sentiment classifier, a pre-trained sentiment classifier. And we want this, the, the prediction of the sentiment to be the same uh, with the input sentiment. Right? So you can see there, is, there can be a loop, um, like given we generate the y, and we feed this y into a sentiment classifier, and this sentiment classifier uh, we want this sentiment classifier to 
like recover this input sentiment. Yeah, so we can see uh, there are basically two loss functions, and we will um, optimize these two loss functions jointly. So um, the first, intuitively, right, these, these two uh, loss functions will have like will kind of like drive the model towards two di two directions. Like this is the why we completely um, recover this input sentence x, and the cl the classification laws basically will encourage the y to. Um, really like uh, implements these uh, desired attributes. And if we optimize these two losses jointly, we'll kind of like drive the model towards the direction we expected. So, and because like basically these two losses are competitive and minimizing these joint, the two losses jointly will uh, avoid the model to like uh, collapse. But, uh, in terms of this competitive loss right here, um, Right. Um, basically, uh, if we can see like this classification laws will prevent the model to generate exactly the same x, right? Because like x does not really fit this this criteria, right? So, and also like here uh, for classification laws, the autoencoding laws will pre uh, in a sense like be competitive with this classification laws because like uh, say uh, given whatever uh, sentence, right? If um, we only have this classification laws. Then, like, uh, given a positive sentiment, this this decoder can generate whatever sentence, right? So it, that is uh, of positive sentiment, uh, regardless of the input sentence. So you can see these these two loss functions are basically competitive with each other, but they can be optimized jointly to like uh, have a, like a joint objective to like push the model to what um, towards what we um, uh, we desire, basically. So um, the performance, um, yeah. Uh, so if we jointly optimize these two loss functions, we can basically get a like a, a sentiment accuracy towards like uh, above like 80, uh, 90 percent, and the blue score against the input sentence around the 55 is kind of like a pretty uh, decent result. Basically, the blue score evaluates the similarity between the output and the input. Right, and uh, uh, here are some like examples. Right, uh, given the input, and uh, say we want to change this to a, a positive sentiment. Right, um, here are the inputs. Like, um, I could give them a zero star, and uh, the output is like give them a sweetheart zero, a star review. So, um, you can see like uh, this this model basically learns to like uh, correctly like. Uh, to like change the sentiment from negative to positive, right? And uh, you can see this output is pretty close to the to the input, right? We kind of like preserve all other tokens uh, that is that are independent with the um, sentiment. But uh, uh, there's a particular problem here, right? The language mo the language quality is not not very good, right? Because uh, a sweet hard start view is not a correct language. And uh, uh, this is also reflected in um, the perplexity. If we use a language model to evaluate the perplexity of the outputs, we get a very high perplexity, which means the language quality is not very good. So uh, we, we can certainly like we can improve this model like by using another type of objective, another type of loss function. We use a language model as the direct supervision. Um, the, so the additional loss function is like, uh, given the we sample, uh, we, we get the output right from the model, and the objectives like we want to maximize the uh, likelihood of this sample uh, under a language model. So basically, we want like uh, change this, the generation model so that the samples will have um, will have like a low language uh, language model perplexity. And the with this additional loss function, right? We basically like train the three loss functions to jointly, and uh, then we, we kind of like get like uh, a high accuracy and uh, kind of like preserve the input sentence pretty well and uh, get a low like language language model perplexity. And here's the some of the samples. Right? If I can give them a great star review, I would, right? So um, basically, this language model corrects this. 
um, this sentence into this uh, uh, this sentence, right? Okay, so this is the uh, the first example on um, app task. Like um, the key idea is like we decompose the task into competitive competitive sub objectives, and use this direct supervision for each of the um, sub objectives. Like first to like preserve the sentiment, to like change the sentiment, we use the sentiment classifier as the direct supervision. Like to like preserve the input contents or other aspects, we just use the order encoding laws to like um to to like provide the supervision, and to improve the language quality with a language model to uh, provide the supervision. Yeah. So um, this is the first application setting, and the second. Um, setting that's pretty uh, close to the first one is that we can um, generate the sentence to describe a content in a given data record. And uh, again, here we want to control the, like, uh, the, the, the writing style of the sentence uh, giving a, by giving a reference sentence. Like here, right, this is a, a content record, a table basically. We want to generate a sentence that describe this content. And, uh, um, but there are a lot of ways to like, describe the content, right? We can have different writing styles. Um, to control this writing, the writing style, we, we then like, provide an additional sentence, a reference sentence, right? Which, is, which was written like, by human and, and to describe a different content. So the task is like, um, how can we rewrite this reference sentence to describe the new content? Right, so um, the, the desired output here is like uh, LeBron James that the way it was, that we, with the exactly the same wording and 32 points right, from this uh, content and the seven assist and other, uh, um, and other, con other content. Yeah, so um, basically the goal is like we want to control the writing style using the writing style of the reference sentence. Um, the, the method is pretty uh, similar to the, the method in the first task, because again, like we want to basically we want to preserve the, the, the all the aspect of the reference sentence. We are only changing the content, right? So again, we can kind of decompose this task into different subtasks, sub sub objectives, and use direct supervision to encourage uh, to ensure the model can like accomplish the each of the sub, uh, sub objectives. Yeah, I won't go into more details, but here are some like results. Like um, with this input, with this reference sentence, um, we, our model, our approach basically like, uh, produce these results as uh, as expected. And there are different ways of like as a baseline, like low based methods and like uh, other like other particular methods. Okay, so um, here are some like uh, quantitative evaluation. I will skip. I will skip this. Okay, so this is uh, the first part, like sentence level control. Like, how can we like change the attributes of a sentence, like a sentiment, or like how can we rewrite the content of a sentence to express the uh, kind of new set of content. The next part um, at the conversation level, right? How can we like control the uh, um, the conversation, uh, especially say the um, the conversation strategy or the topic in in a open domain conversation system. So uh, a very quick overview of the um, of conversation system research. There are basically two set of um, conversation systems. The first is a task oriented dialogue. So in this type of conversation system. We use this dialogue system to like adjust a specific task, like booking a flight, like res like reserving a, a restaurant. So this type of dialogue is usually closed domain. Right? So, um, we have a chatbot for a particular like airline uh, company, right? Like this this chatbot will help you to like book a flight, but this this chatbot cannot do any anything else. So this is a closed domain conversation. And we have like a chit chat for open domain conversation. Um, the goal is to like improve the user engagement. The metric is like how long 
this this chatbot can like keep it uh, uh, conversing with 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 a human. And this conversation is usually uh, just a random conversation and without any like control on the topic or whatever uh, aspect. Um, so the the third the third kind of like type of conversation, which is a a new research direction, is how we can like basically combine these two uh, type of conversations. First is still open domain conversation. It basically can converse with human uh, about whatever topic. But at the same time, we want to control the conversation strategy to reach a desired topic at the end of the conversation. Like so, um, so we basically we want the chatbot like studying from whatever topic, right? We want the chatbot to proactively and uh, sometimes implicitly um, guide the conversation flow to a particular uh, target topic. So, um, so this this type of application, this type of conversation system can be used in like a conversational recommender system, like or like in education or in like uh, psychotherapy. So imagine like in psychotherapy, right? Uh, a doctor will chat kind of like a chat with the, the patient, right? Kind of, and this conversation is very relaxed. It's, kind of, uh, it's an open domain conversation. But the, the doctor has some like implicit goal, right? It, he wants like basically uh, guide the topic towards a particular, to particular uh, topic, right? So that um, it will like inspire the patient to like speak up, to speak up like whatever the patient is thinking um, and the relevant to the, uh, their uh, whatever like a disease or other issues. Yeah, so um, basically, again, we can like decompose the task into two um, sub-objectives. The, um, the first objective is like starting from any topic. We want the conversation system to reach a desired topic at the end of conversation. This is the so-called target guided. And at the same time, we want this conversation to be natural, right? We want uh, this topic transition to be very smooth so that the conversation is, like a, uh, very, is kind of engaging with the, with, with the human. So, um, so this, is, this is one example, right? Um, starting from whatever topic, like a, this general greeting, the desired topic is like say ebooks. Say in a conversation, uh, in a recommended system, we want to recommend the the, uh, the customers to like a, basically to buy an ebook, right? So um, this is the conversation between the agent and the human, and we can see like a, in this conversation, right? Um, the topic of the conversation basically um, is like basically translates like gradually from whatever like tired. Sorry, work, work, work program, coding book, and then ebooks, right? And then we can also see this, this conversation is pretty natural. Like uh, um, this topic transition is pretty uh, smooth. So this is the goal uh, we want to achieve in this particular task. So and the, the, the challenge here is again, like we don't have direct supervision data. So um, the solution, right, um, with these competitive sub, uh, sub objectives. And these partial supervisions, right? First, to enable this natural conversation, um, we can use rich um, chit chat data to learn smooth single turn transition. Because um, in, we have a lot of data for like, uh, this chit chat uh, conversation. And this, this chit chat conversation basically provides the information about what do we mean by like, um, smooth transition, right? So, here, like I say, from whatever um, sentence from whatever like sentence right, or like a conversation history, how we can generate a smooth um, response to this history. We can learn uh, use this uh, natural uh, this chit chat data. And the, the second goal, right, to reach a desired target, uh, we could use like rule based multi term planning. Like we want the keywords um, of each of the uh, uh, responses to like a kind of like getting to like a get closer to this um to the to the to the, the target conversation to the target topic at each step. So here's a a, a high level uh, 
uh, illustration of the model of the modern architecture, given an utterance like a, by a human, right? I'm writing a chatbot history program. We first extract the keywords from the utterance, which is the program. We can see this keyword as the topic of this particular uh, utterance. Right, so this is the keyword extraction. And then uh, we have like a, we have like keywords like conditional response retrieval. Like this is a retrieval based uh, conversation system. But of course we can use like a generation based um, response um, model. Basically like given this, uh, given this new like uh, topic uh, keywords, we want to generate a response to this uh, utterance. And uh, here, like, uh, given this coding a book, right, we generate, like, uh, interesting, I read about coding from a book. Uh, so this is a uh, implementation and realization of this uh, topic. And the key thing is, the, is this part, like, how we can do this topic transition, right, from programming to uh, coding and book. Um, we, we could somehow use a kind of like a particular model, a kernel-based model, like uh, to like uh, to like capture this topic transition, and plus a uh, target rule, guided rule. So first, um, we want this transition, right? We want, uh, given whatever to uh, keywords, we want to translate this topic from these keywords to another keyword that is like a closer, that is closer to the. Um, to the target keywords, right? This is the target topic we want to achieve um, at the end of the conversation. So from program, we basically translate it to like coding book because book is closer to ebook, right? So we use uh, what we we kind of like evaluate the distance between the keywords on in the word embedding space. Yeah. So um, yeah, this is the next. Uh, the next keywords must, must get closer to the target keywords. And also, uh, we want to achieve this smooth transition, right? So uh, we want to constrain the here, right? Um, the two keywords, the next keywords, will be close to the original uh, keywords in the word embedding space. Right? So this basically makes uh, ensure that the, the next topic is semantically close to the uh, current topic. So this ensures this smooth transition. And we can tune the weight of one and two to control the aggressiveness of the chatbot. Like how aggressive this chatbot will guide the conversation from this original topic to the, um, to the target topic. Yeah, so basically um, there are two, these are two like competitive um, uh, kind of like um, losses or like uh, objectives, right? And we combine these two to, to basically like achieve the so called target guided open domain conversation. So here are some results, like uh, the target is dancing, right? Um, and from whatever um, topic, we see like uh, the conversation, like um, playing sports, the topic is sports, and then basket basketball, and the, I like basketball, which is the topic about the interest. And uh, then like rap music, right? So you can see like from sports, Interest, music, music and the song, and then, uh, and then singing, right? And then from singing to like a, to to dancing, right? So um, you can see there is a clear like um, topic transition, uh, like basically throughout the the course of conversation. But of course there are this this is kind of like a, a pretty like um simple and uh, um, preliminary solution, and there are different, um, of course, this, this system can like, uh, fail like, in, in different cases. Yeah, so overall, like, um, this is the, how we can do like, uh, unsupervised controlled, controllable uh, text generation uh, like, uh, at both like, sentence level or composition level. The key idea is the, is the same, like we com decompose the complex task into competitive sub-objectives. And each of the sub-objectives can have like a direct supervision for, like a, for learning. And if we kind of like a train this on our sub-objectives jointly, we basically can like drive the model in, uh, towards the direction we want. 
Okay, so uh, this is pretty much uh, about this, uh, this part. For generating text that contains desired information from input, in, from input. And uh, yeah, this, um, the two central goals, right, for text generation, how we can generate natural language and how we can generate the uh, outputs that uh, is like containing um, relevant information. Okay, so this is uh, pretty much of this lecture. If, uh, any questions? Yeah, cool. Um, I'm happy to like take questions offline.